The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. Berute Galdicus is part of a trio of remarkable women. Along with Jane Goodall and the late Diane Fossey, Galdicus was one of Louis Leakey's angels sent to do long-term study of primate behavior in the wild. Galdicus tells her story in Reflections of Eden, My Years with the Orangutans of Borneo. The book details two extraordinary decades of work and introduces us to a world she says is in grave danger of vanishing forever. Galdicus holds dual professorships at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and University Nacional in Jakarta. She also serves as president of the Los Angeles-based Orangutan Foundation International. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Thank you. I guess uh, to begin in two words, why you? How did you get selected? How did you get chosen? And how did you choose this field? Well, I always wanted to study orangutans. I was very interested in human prehistory because once you are interested in human prehistory and you go back of it, you come face to face with an ancestor, with a creature that was very much like the great apes today. So my interest in orangutans arose out of my interest in humans. And how did you cross paths with Louis Leakey? I went up to him after a lecture. Um, I asked him to uh, help me uh, with my orangutan study. And uh, <coughs> it turned out that um, he had been looking for somebody to study orangutans. So in a funny kind of way, I walked into his life. He was expecting me. Hmm. And it, it, we don't want to make it sound like uh, he tapped you on the shoulder and poof, all of a sudden you were in, in the no. jungles of Borneo. It took a very long time. No, it wasn't anything like that. Um, in, in fact, at that initial meeting with Louis Leakey, when I asked him to help me with my orangutan study, initially he barely glanced at me. I mean, it, he, he really almost didn't want to hear about it. It was only once I told him that I had uh, written letters to the Malaysian government, that I had written a letter to Tom Harrison. Only then did he suddenly look at me, almost as though he was seeing me for the first time, even though I'd been standing there for a minute or two. So it was as though he wanted some kind of evidence of how serious you were about Absolutely. this work. Absolutely. I have a feeling that Louis Leakey was constantly approached by people who wanted help, or who, who wanted this, or who wanted that, who wanted to go to Olduvai or who wanted to be graduate students or whatever. So he needed evidence that this really was going to happen. In fact, he once told me, he said, I will always support someone who knows what they want to do and will go out and do it. And I, I think the crucial part was who will go out and do it. What did we know, what did the world know about orangutans at the time you began your field studies? When I began my field studies, the world knew very little about orangutans. There had been several researchers who had gone into the field, but at the time that I went out, none of them had yet published their findings. Um, so the world knew very little. The world knew the orangutans as a rather mysterious great ape. Somebody referred to them as the Greta Garbos of that's the right. primate world. Yeah, that's, that's what I called them, the Greta Garbos of the primate world, who wanted to be alone and who uh, seemed to be somewhat nomadic, somewhat migratory. Uh, there was even some question about whether they were primarily fruit eaters or leaf eaters. Uh, there was some question about whether or not they had always been Greta Garbos. So there were a lot of questions and very few answers at the time that I went out into the field. The general impression was these were pretty solitary animals and very hard to study. Exactly, and, but people didn't quite believe that they could be as solitary as they seemed to be. 
everybody thought that something was wrong. They, that made them uneasy because, you see, primates are the most social of all mammalian orders. We're going to take a look at a, uh, a clip, a little piece of video that shows us some of the, the place where you worked and some of your subjects, the orangutans. Okay. Now, this is Tanya. Tanya is one of the surviving Bangkok Six. And uh, she was returned to the forest in 1990. And she is tough. Uh, this poor creature had been smuggled in a crate um, for like over two days, two nights, and confiscated at the airport in uh, Bangkok, and then turned over to us. Ah, we're looking at a forbidden treat. That's right. Uh, for orangutans, food is life. There's nothing more interesting than food. And boy, oh boy, do they love chocolate. <laughs> now, are all the orangutans we're looking at, are they rehabilitated animals? The two, the two or three, oh, all these, including the two or three that we saw previously, are all wild-born ex-captive orangutans who are in the process of returning to the wild. This is like a family picnic. Yeah, it is a family picnic, and uh, they're happy um, to see me. And in fact, look at this, there's a little squabbling going on. One <laughs> wants to be held and doesn't want others to be close. They're very jealous. It's, it's really amazing. In, in, in some ways, they so resemble uh, human kids, it's, it's astonishing. Mom's handing out the snacks. Well, for orangutans, Food is the end-all and be-all. And here we see how the great intelligence of orangutans is expressed in the way that they locomote. I mean, it's not easy locomoting through this sort of tri-dimensional world of, of the tropical rainforest. And this is what we're looking at is really the behavior that's normal. They, they live in the trees. That's right. They hang upside down. <laughs> They sway back and forth on from vines. Actually, it is quite normal. I, I've, this is, an, again, a, an ex-captive, but I've seen many wild juveniles do exactly the same thing. And they spend a lot of time, especially as juveniles and adolescents, manipulating the vegetation and their environment, sort of learning the strengths, the, tex mm. the, the tensile strengths of uh, of vines and trees. Now, we, we mentioned the rehabilitants, and you, in your work, you found yourself with two really very different duties, the rehabilitation of animals that had been captured or kept as pets, and then the research that you were actually doing with the wild animals in the field. That's right. So the primary, my primary purpose has always been to study the wild orangutans, to learn about them. Only once we know about their adaptations, will it be possible to understand them and ultimately save them? But in addition, uh, the tropical rainforest, of course, is under great uh, pressure, and orangutan habitats are being destroyed in ever increasing rate. And the net result of this is that many orangutans are killed as their habitats are destroyed. Once an orangutan leaves the tropical rainforest, once the forest is destroyed underneath him or her, he or she is left homeless. They become refugees. They have no place to run, no place to hide, and they become absolutely vulnerable to any person who has a spear and a pack of dogs. Hmm. So are the, the, the orangutans you're getting now, they're, they're actually being driven out of their homes as opposed to the early rehabilitants who, were, who had been taken to the city and kept as pets? Well, the... The process is more or less the same. Uh, now, you're, you're absolutely correct. There seems to be more uh, of a situation where orangutans are simply killed because they're there, out in the open, and their infants taken away from them. While in the past, there did seem to be much more of a trade in them. But in recent years, the um, orangutan pet trade, especially the international orangutan pet trade, has basically been uh, closed off. There's been a lot of pressure put on. On the government um, and on such governments as the government of Taiwan to keep 
orangutans from coming into Taiwan. Taiwan was one place where literally thousands of orangutan infants and juveniles were sent during the late 1980s and early 1990s because the price of an orangutan in Taiwan was as high as uh, six, seven, eight thousand dollars for a cute infant. We mentioned that the, the two responsibilities that you had, and we probably really need to stress how difficult those two things were because once you brought an orangutan to your camp as a rehabilitant, they seemed to get very attached to you. I mean, quite literally. They, they would hang on to you and not let you go. And I, I marveled at how you could manage to raise, essentially, a group of furry children and still manage to get out into the field and do fairly arduous tracking of wild animals. Well, you really hit the nail on the head, <laughs> uh, to put it mildly. Uh, in the wild, orangutan females have probably what is the most intense relationship with their offspring of any mammal. An orangutan infant and juvenile spends the first nine to ten years of his or her life a hundred percent with the mother. It isn't until he or she is about nine or ten years old that, they, that he or she takes off, leaves the mother. So when these ex-captive wild-born infants were brought into camp, they transferred this very intense bond that they had with their mothers to me. I became the surrogate mother. And yes, that bond is very intense. Mm. And it made it very difficult to go into the forest and study the wild orangutans. I mean, I was faced with every working mother's dilemma, and that is, what do you do with the kids when you go off to work in the morning? And it was a constant dilemma. I mean, I sometimes had three or four orangutan infants hanging onto me. Every limb was covered by an orangutan. Mm -hmm. And there might be a gibbon hanging onto my ankle. And sometimes the most that I could do in a day was move myself over to uh, the washroom. I mean, it, it, it was a real problem. And um, eventually, as the orangutans got a little bit older, it was possible to leave them at Camp Leakey when I went into, when I went into the forest to study the wild orangutans. Mm. Sheds new light on anybody who's complained about how difficult it is to put together their dissertation and their thesis. Oh, I think it's true. Um, I, I th there were times when I thought that, that I would uh, go crazy. It's the name of a song, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a look at some slides. We have some pictures of, uh, of what your world, when you, when you live in Borneo, what your world is like. Let me take a look at those. Now, this is the bridge uh, to Camp Leakey. This is a fairly recent phenomenon. That wasn't there when you got there. No, but the, uh, the local government built the bridge about four or five years after I got there, at my request. And uh, until recently, we um, did our daily feedings on the bridge. Nowadays, if you came to Camp Leakey, you wouldn't encounter quite as many wild-born ex-captive orangutans on that bridge. But you might encounter one or two at the end. Uh, this was a picture taken well over 20 years ago. This is my first hut at Camp Leakey, and it was bark-walled and thatch-roofed, and it had one window. And you can see the back, the orangutans had torn uh, away the bark. After all, orangutans eat bark. <laughs> so it got a little bit drafty, but uh, this is Kumai. Kumai is the closest town to my study area, and this is where the journey to Camp Leakey begins. We take a boat and go about 50 kilometers, which is about, I guess, 35 miles, up river. It's lovely. Uh, again, this picture was taken a number of years ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago. And Gary Shapiro, who is the young man in the picture, was my first graduate student from North America, uh, at that time from the University of Oklahoma, and he taught several of the wild-born ex-captive orangutans sign language. He had initially worked with Washa, who was the, the first uh, signing Pongid, and he wanted to uh, teach orangutans in the forest sign language, and his star pupil was Princess, and his other star pupil was Rini, who was a, uh, an adult female, and Rini actually went back into the wild. My son, Binti, when he was about one year of age, Binti is now 18, so this picture was taken 17 years ago, 
And um, bathing is a very uh, important part of the day when you're in the humid tropics. You get very, uh, sort of very hot, and it feels like your your pores have been glued together with you know with heavy glue. And people take baths all the time there. Is that soap on the orangutans? Yes, paws? and and the orangutans, the ex captive orangutans in particular, love soap. And, and uh, to them, it's like eating whipped cream. cream. They, they kind of froth it up in sort of great <clears throat> bubbles and, and, and billows of foam. And then they just lap it up. And you know, so basically is fat. When they say that, that ivory is 99.9% .9 pure, what they're saying is that ivory is 99.9% .9 fat. Fascinating pictures. We're going to take you. a look at a, at a few more. So here you were doing research, rehabilitating these young orangutans, and about five years into your work, your own child comes along, Binti. How did that change everything? And, and what was his upbringing like? I mean, his pals were the orangutans. Well, it changed everything. Having Binti really um, caused me to reevaluate uh, my relationship with uh, many of the ex-captive wild-born orangutans. Uh, for one thing, um, many of the original ex-captives were now much older, but the new group that had come in, I could not be as close to them. I had to sever this intense bond that orangutans have for their surrogate mothers, and it forced me, or caused me, to um, hire more assistants and, as it were, farm out the, uh, the work. Uh, I was also very concerned that uh, Binti not get any kind kind of diseases, not so much from the orangutans, but perhaps from you know any dirt adhering to the orangutan's hair. So every time an orangutan came close to Binti, we would grab that orangutan and bathe him or her in boiled water and soap to make sure before he or she touched Binti that he or she would be clean. Now, not surprisingly, I suppose, your son developed a, a lot of skills as a very young child. A lot of them probably attributable to his, to his playmates. He was, for example, quite a climber. It was amazing. It was just amazing. I mean, Binti loved to climb. Uh, I remember one incident when, uh, even in Jakarta, when Binti disappeared at my friend's house, and I knew that he couldn't have left the house because we were in an enclosed courtyard. And I was calling Binti, Binti. I was getting really worried. And suddenly, I heard Binti laugh. And I looked up, and Binti had climbed up to the top of this little, uh, this little water tower that the household had. How does he remember those days? Oh, he doesn't remember them at all. In fact, he, mm -hmm. gets, he gets quite annoyed when people ask him. <laughs> he says, I was two. I was three, he'll say. I don't remember a thing. Sounds just like an 18-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he does remember the times when he's come back subsequently, and uh, he and Princess just, and they were pals. I mean, Princess was, was Binti's best friend when he was, was two. Uh, he used to sign to her. She never really signed to him, but he used to sign to her because he thought that that was the way that orangutans communicated. And Binti learned over 40 signs, even though nobody was teaching him, just from watching. Gary teach the orangutans. Hmm. So you really got to, to see both sets of youngsters learn what they could from each other and, and discover what one couldn't learn from the other. Yeah, it was a very interesting thing uh, that Binti seemed to learn more from the orangutans than the orangutans learned from Binti. Hmm. I mean, Binti picked up things from the orangutans. <laughs> you mentioned the climbing. That was one of those things. Uh, he could do orangutan facial expressions perfectly. He could do orangutan postures perfectly. A great little mimic. Well, I think he's a typical little child. I mean, that, he was a typical little child. I think that's mm. the way little kids are. I want to take a look at, uh, at just a few more slides that were taken of, uh, of your subjects. Now, this is a proboscis monkey. Proboscis monkeys are uh, large monkeys that are found in the mangrove uh, and Nipah swamps of coastal Borneo, and we, we have many of them in our study area. They're not apes, they're monkeys. Now, we were talking about imitation and how Binti imitated uh, some of the ex-captive orangutans, but here we have an, uh, 
an instance where the ex-captive orangutans are imitating humans, and the orangutans loved to steal boats. And, you know, we, we had to learn how to tie ever more elaborate knots to keep our, uh, our, our boats um, by the side of the river. This is a shot of a wild adult female orangutan and her large infant. It's sort of the typical relationship, very, very close. Very, very intense. And I think this, it is the intenseness of this relationship that helps allow the orangutans to be so solitary once they grow up, hmm. paradoxical as that may seem. Now, this is a picture that was taken maybe 22, 23 years ago, many, many years ago, when I first went to Borneo. And I am in the top of a tree, a small tree, with my first ex-captive orangutan, one that I raised, and his name is Sugito. And I'm trying to imitate wild orangutan mothers <laughs> and their relationships with their offspring. So I would go up, I would climb into the trees and, and, and stay there with Sugito. And he was quite the rascal. Oh, absolutely. He was... People uh, will have to read the book. There are <laughs> lots of Sugito stories in that book. That's and right. he's quite a character. Yes, he was. When I looked at that picture, I was struck by the two women who had gone ahead of you in the primate field studies, Jane mm -hmm. Goodall and the late Diane Fossey. How much did they influence your work, the style of their research? Well, the style of, of our research is different because our apes are very different and the ecology of the places where we work is very different. Uh, but they influ influenced me a great deal, I think, in a general sense. They were role models for me. I wasn't conscious of it at the time when I first began my work. It was only in later years I began, I, I became cognizant of how much they had influenced me. In what ways? Well, I think, sort of going back as far as I can, that had Jane Goodall not gone into the forest at Gombe, um, that it probably would have been much more difficult for me to go and study orangutans. Louis Leakey was able to find funding for me because both Jane and Diane had been successful. When I was reading about their work, you discussed their work in your book, I was struck by a similarity that, that sort of summed up in the phrase, a, a kind of research that's collaboration as opposed to control. That's right. And it's a very special kind of relationship that you have, and sometimes controversial relationship that you have with the subjects of your research. That's right. And, and, and Jane Goodall pioneered it. I mean, Jane Goodall was the first person who went into the forest and just watched her study animals who habituated them to the point where they paid absolutely no attention to her and who followed them and observed them year in, year out. So she was the first person who compiled multi-generational studies of the wild of, of the wild And animals. really became part of the environment. Well, she became part of the environment in that the chimpanzees did not react to her. Um, it is. It was a stunning feat to habituate the chimpanzees. Uh, I know this because I've talked to people who have tried to study chimpanzees elsewhere. We, we it, it's forgotten what a remarkable thing it was for this young woman, how you know, 30 or so years ago, 35 years ago, however many years ago it was, to go into the wild and to actually get so close to the chimpanzees that she was able to see, you know, what the details of what their hands were doing. And like the, the footage that we've seen of you today, there was footage of Diane Fossey, a particular clip with her and, and an animal named Digit, mm -hmm. and a remarkable, again, a relationship that really crossed some kind of bridge between the two species. There are people who are critical of that and who seemed to be very uncomfortable with the idea, uh, there were people who were uncomfortable with the idea of Diane Fossey being an advocate of conservation, of stepping outside of the role of the researcher. When people question you about that, how do you respond? Well, uh, my response is basically, when you're studying an animal and that animal is on the verge of extinction, you have a moral duty 
to go and try and help that animal or that population or that species. It's that simple. You, can't, you don't want to be in a position where you say the operation was a success. In other words, the science was good, but the patient died. But the species that you studied went extinct. I mean, I, I think that's wrong. I was interested in it. It seems like things have, the pendulum seems to have swung so drastically. The early primate studies that were conducted, the animals were shot and killed Absolutely. at the end of the experiment and dissected, taken apart. That's right. Now there seems to be such a strong feeling of just letting them alone where they are, in a, even a kind of romanticism about, well, you shouldn't give them food, as we saw, or, we, or you shouldn't somehow interfere, that they should just exist in nature. Well, I would hope that that would be the, the, the prominent viewpoint. Um, it's not necessarily. I mean, people still catch animals, people still tag them, people do all kinds of things in the name of science, and sometimes those things are 100% legitimate and credible. But, you know, humans still very much are masters of the planet and masters of all they survey, and I, th I think the, uh, the human hand is very evident in the way that we relate to the natural world. I just watched a, a retrospective that National Geographic put together. And one of the, the portions of the, the narration really struck me. And the, the voice of the narrator says, it's no longer enough to protect wildlife. It takes active human help for better or for worse. We have become the keepers of the wild. Amen. It's really true. It's really true. How safe are the animals that you've spent more than 20 years of your life studying? Well, the ones that I've actually studied, the ones in my study area in the national park that we um, helped establish um, are relatively safe. But unfortunately, orangutans outside these protected areas are not that safe. And that's why there's still such uh, a need for conservation and rehabilitation uh, programs. Uh, I just have this very sinking feeling that uh, orangutans are going to be like the American bison. Mm. And that is that 150 years ago, when we traveled and we went to the Great Plains, the uh, landscape you know, up to the horizon was filled with these black dots thousands of them, perhaps hundreds of thousands, millions of them, that were the American bison. Now, we go back to those same plains and the bison are gone. There are herds of bison, relic herds of bison, on ranches. I mean, I've heard that Ted Turner, in fact, owns sort the largest... Sort of semi-domesticated bison. Yes, owns one of the largest herds of bison in existence. And there are bison in uh, um, state parks, provincial parks, but the bison no longer impact the ecosystem of the Great Plains. In other words, as far as the Great Plains are concerned, the bison are gone. They're just relics that are, that are exactly like you said, that are, that are, they're, they owe their existence to the hand of humans. In fact, the only place where I myself saw bison in the wild was on Catalina Island, mm. and that's because some wealthy family uh, release some bison there. For people who are, who are interested in the rainforest in Brazil, they should read your book because there are so many parallels in terms of what's going on. We're out of time. Barute Galdigas, I want to thank you so much for talking about your work and about your new book, Reflections of Eden. Well, thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> Best wishes. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.